Well, hi everybody. Thanks for coming and uh, for waiting and being so patient. Uh, my name is Jeff Jarvis. Uh, I'm a representative of Lesseur County Historical Society. And we have uh, the second of three programs, uh, art history programs on artists from the Dane Art Collection that the County Historical Society has. And tonight the program is on Roger Price and some of you may know him. Uh, hopefully at the end of this hour you may come to know Roger in a different way or take some new information home with you. Well just a little bit about the Seward County Historical Society. Uh, the mission is uh, of the Historical Society is to collect, preserve, and tell the story of Lesseur County through a collection of historic sites, a research center, exhibits, educational programming, and through artifact collections. And tonight is an educational program, so we are living up to the Historical Society's mission. And so we're going to give you a little bit of art history tonight. And we're going to start out with um, talking just a little bit about the, the Dane Art Collection. I almost fell over. Um, so, um, the uh, Historical Society is a repository for this really great collection with, uh, that holds uh, a lot of different artwork from different individuals. These top three guys, Adolf Dane, Roger Price, and David Maz, were selected for the Art History Series because they either grew up in Lesseur County and Waterville or they practiced their art like David Maz did just outside of Waterville at Fish Lake. So, like I mentioned, we're doing Roger Price's story tonight, but um, the uh, Historical Society thought it was important to illustrate what these uh, artists have done in the county and especially uh, through the artwork and with Roger Price's work in conservation and through his wildlife artwork. So, next one here. so uh, j jumping right into it here, uh, Roger's early days, uh, uh, one of the, the nicer, more uh, humanitarian uh, stories was when Roger was young, he uh, would go duck hunting and he would rescue the crippled ducks. There's a lot of ducks that don't get, they get shot and they go hiding in the bulrushes. And um, so Roger would uh, gather up those ducks and bring them home and nurse the ducks back to health. So he, uh, he kind of ran a duck hospital, which is kind of an unusual thing. And, you know, nowadays kids, you know, they, you know, they're, a little bit more interested in their phones and um, you know different things, skateboards or whatever. But uh, uh, even in uh, grade school, Roger won art awards, you know, for his drawings and um, th and they uh, his first drawings were all centered around wildlife and nature. And uh, from what I understand, he was. Um, he would go out his back door and be in nature, and that's what he saw and emulated in his, even in his, in his early work, and uh, carried on into his adult years too. So uh, after Roger graduated from Waterville High School here, he went to the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, just like uh, his predecessor Adolf Dean did. Uh, Roger and Adolf were a generation apart, but uh, Roger was influenced by Adolf's work, and I'll tell you about that later. But early on, uh, Roger had a, a passion for art and conservation, uh, and then I think the writing came a little bit later, which is really quite a skill set for a creative person to have, because you could do the art and you can do uh, work for conservation, and then you can write about it too. 
and uh, the writing is really a useful skill to have, and we'll talk more about that too. But um, after uh, high school and uh, MCAD, he, Roger went into the U.S. Navy in the 40s, and um, he served our country. So. Uh, not many people are as fortunate as Roger where, you know, they, they win a duck stamp to jumpstart their career. Uh, winning a duck stamp is like, if you're an actor, it's winning an Oscar award. Um, it uh, immediately sets you up to, uh, nowadays, to be a millionaire. And, um, but uh, the duck stamp is, uh, uh, a fantastic juried art, uh, a government art contest. It's the only contest that the government holds on that level. So, so uh, anyway, uh, Roger won the duck stamp when he was age 26, and that would be in 1948 and 49. Um, he was the youngest artist and the first Minnesota artist to win it. Up to that point, the, uh, for 14 years, the uh, uh, U.S. Department of the Interior, the, they had the duck stamp program going for 14 years, and they would just dole out the artwork for the stamp to artists of their choice. But the year that Roger entered, it was the first year that it was a juried art competition, and, and that's the way it still is from 1948 to present. But Roger won the first competition. Before that, it was just um, by luck, if you were, you know, luck of the draw, if you were picked to do the federal stamp. So it's kind of a feather in Roger's cap that he was picked out of 20-some uh, artists who uh, um, they selected his work out of 20-some paintings. So uh, that year, almost two million stamps were sold, mostly to hunters, conservationists, stamp collectors, two bucks each. And if you, um, in today's math, that's like almost four million dollars. Uh, and that was in 1948. Uh, I've read that like up to 95% of the proceeds of the duck stamp sales go to acquiring uh, wildlife wetlands and either renting, leasing, or outright purchase of uh, habitat for waterfowl. So it's really a wonderful program. It's one of uh, the most wonderful programs that our government offers, actually. So I'm sure we could throw a joke in there about that, too, but we're not going to go there tonight. Uh, so anyway, uh, it's, it's a very, very good program. Uh, since the program's inception in, in 1934, uh, nearly a billion dollars has been pumped into uh, conserving wetlands, acquiring lands. Um, anyway, so uh, Roger, uh, Roger's career as a wildlife artist really got a great jump start in 1948, and he never looked back. Oops. Okay, so this is a, a picture of the uh, the winning entry of the duck stamp in 1948, and back in the 40s, 30s, and 40s, lithic lithography was really a big thing, and Roger's work was done on a litho stone. It was like a 20-pound stone, limestone with a polished surface that the uh, this particular image was engraved in. Okay. So, um, so there really was no original. The original stone had a bunch of prints made from it. So, um, back in that day, lithography was really uh, a big thing. Adolf Dane, the predecessor to uh, Roger, uh, made a living out of doing uh, his artwork on lithography, lithograph stones. So and we're not going to go into 
how that's all produced, but um, the simplest form of lithography is one color. That's why you, what you see is pretty much black and white. So uh, once the um, artwork was, uh, print was pulled off the stone, um, the winning uh, print was sent to the U.S. Department of Interior. They have an engraver that engraved the uh, image, okay? So um, if they were to print it on millions of stamps, it had to be a lot more black and white and reproducible. That's why they re-engraved it. So if that makes any sense, I hope it does. Um, kind of dumb it down a little bit here. Um, so anyway, uh, the wetlands were disappearing at a, a pretty uh, quick rate back in the 30s when the duck stamp program was started. Um, that's when the Dust Bowl was big, you know, it was just after uh, the Great Depression or during the Great Depression, the lingering days and the Dust Bowl days. and. Um, so the government stepped in and uh, designed the duck stamp program to uh, uh, conserve the wildlife wetlands. And um, out west, you know, where the Dust Bowl was, of course, uh, I'm not sure what they did, but... So there was a lot of uh, um, natural resources that were being protected with that program. So, go down here. So anyway, um, so as Roger got moving along in his career, he started rubbing elbows with a lot of really influential people, and um, he had a way of, uh, uh, I, I think he really enjoyed people, and uh, he, uh, he let people know that he was a, a Waterville native, and by this time he was uh, going in different circles you know, up in the Twin Cities and uh, rubbing elbows with politicians, governors and whatnot, and serving on boards. And uh, Roger never forgot from growing up in Waterville how important the uh, fishing industry was and, and uh, bullheads and whatnot. Uh, at one time, there was 25 families in Waterville that made a living off of commercial fishing, and that includes bullheads. So that also includes uh, seining fish, you know, with nets through the ice in the winter, and uh, just different forms of fishing altogether. But uh, Roger uh, commented to me that uh, he, he knew um, how important tourism was to Waterville, and, and there was this uh, phenomenon that happened in the 30s and 40s where the people from Iowa thought, hey, let's go up to, uh, let's go up north to southern Minnesota and we'll go fish for some bullheads. And uh, that's what they did. And they filled up our resorts here in Waterville and uh, really helped uh, keep a thriving economy going. And uh, the uh, tourism industry and the resorts was, uh, still is, I think, the biggest industry here in town. Uh, you know, Roger, with his influence, talked a lot about uh, the uh, importance of fishing and natural resources down here in Waterville. And he talked about the lowly bullhead and how people really enjoy eating them and how the Iowa people came up here and lined the shores, you know, to um, fill up their pails full of bullheads. and yellow bellies or whisker walleyes, you know, there's all different kinds of names for the bullhead. But um, anyway, uh, incidentally, if you get a Waterville Bullhead Days Festival button, Roger's prominently featured on that, so you can pick yourself up a button here after the program. Just get a hold of Patty here. So, as we went along, uh, uh, you know, the, the Bullhead helped a lot of different uh, groups and organizations thrive. And out here on um, 
Lake Tatonka is the Waterville Sportsman's Club and established in 1936. And uh, a couple things about that. Uh, the uh, I think initially in the early 60s when the Bullhead Day started, the uh, Waterville Sportsman's Group actually got together with Nelmer and Morshing and they uh, skinned thousands of bullheads for the festival here. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a good group activity. <laughs> and, uh, but somebody had to do it. I, I'm not sure who does it now, but uh, in that day, uh, I, I think they did re receive some money for it that helped out uh, the sportsman club. And they did buy uh, some property out there on the west side of Tatanka. And um, Roger uh, published a wildlife calendar and it was distributed all over the country as a national publication. And I read an account where he actually gave the Sportsman's Club a bunch of calendars to sell that they could uh, use the proceeds to help the help their cause. So that was kind of a neat thing. And that's why I put that bullet point up there. So uh, Waterville, biggest ambassador at, you know over the years, I think, has been Roger. He's not the only one, but he, he was pretty prominent. And after you win a duck stamp, you get to be uh, nationally known. And by the early 1960s, 1964, when Bullhead Day started, Roger had been a practicing artist for 20 years or so. And, you know, serving on boards and committees and heading up different uh, wildlife and conservation committees, he, uh, he talked about Waterville quite a bit. So, anyway, Waterville was put on the map. So let's go to the next slide here. Um, um, so we're going to get into uh, looking at some of Roger's artwork here. Uh, this particular painting is of the state fish, the walleye. Uh, it's uh, a pretty uh, straightforward name. Uh, at that time, in 1965, when he did the painting, uh, he was hobnobbing with the different governors from Iowa and, and Minnesota, Governor Rolvog and Harold Hughes. And he presented the, <coughs> the first print to uh, one of the two governors. I'm not sure which one was the lucky one, but excuse me. Anyway, it, uh, this painting is uh, it's just beautiful. It just glows with color. The uh, projected image doesn't really do it justice, but it's a, it's a beautiful rendering of an uh, underwater environment might say it's an underwater landscape with its uh, uh, walleye population swimming through it. But uh, it bears noting that Roger exhibited this painting and many others uh, in exhibitions from California to New York and even uh, in London he did a, an art exhibit as well. So he, uh, he got around quite a bit. And that's what you have to do when you're an artist. You can't wait for people to come to you. You have to bring art to the people. And uh, art doesn't do much good when you're an artist if you just sit at home and paint. It would be like Wesley, our videographer here, doing <coughs> really great videos, but keeping the videos in a desk drawer. You know, you gotta get them out and uh, market yourself. And, and that's what Roger was really good at. Um, he was kind of a, he was a self-promoter in a lot of ways, but you know, if he didn't do it, who would? Type of thing. Um, I call him a shameless self-promoter, but you know, uh, you got to give him credit, you know, for making a living and doing his art. There's not many people that can do it. And this particular picture shows bull moose, uh, kind of defiant, standing front and center, and uh, it's an acrylic painting. Uh, Roger worked in watercolor and uh, oils, but this one I believe was acrylic and it's, it's just beautiful. 
and um, a lot of his work just has a certain glow about it, and um, I think he was pretty proud of that. Um, I might mention that uh, when I had an art studio <clears throat> on Lake Tataka for 15, 20 years, Roger would come rolling in in his dusty old Buick, I think it was a Riviera, and it always had this impeccable coat layer of dust on it. And uh, yeah, I wasn't quite sure why that was, but uh, Roger had a same coating of dust on him too. <laughs> and uh, you know, he was in his late 70s, and I just figured that you know uh, he was working all day out in the field or doing one thing or another. But he'd stop at my place and we'd visit in the driveway. And uh, you know, he, he really didn't have much to say. I, you know, I didn't really know him all that well. And, I certainly know a lot more about him now after doing research, and I, I've got a, a, a newfound sense of uh, admiration for what he's done. But back then, you know, he, he would always mention stuff like, uh, you know, I, some people talk about wildlife art isn't really art. You know, so I think that um, that little issue always kind of bugged him, that maybe he wasn't fully accepted as a fine artist. But um, anyway, that was just one uh, theme that would always come up in our conversations. Um, it wasn't until later that I found out why his car and himself were always so dusty. Here uh, at that time he uh, was living in the Twin Cities and he would come back to Waterville to gather nuts. He would gather nuts and he'd have five gallon pails full of nuts in his Buick's um, trunk. And uh, somebody told me, I forget who, but they said, yeah, Roger would gather nuts to feed the squirrels in Minneapolis, <laughs> where he lived. And I, I thought, you know, that's pretty funny because most people are busy trying to get rid of squirrels and here Roger is feeding them. So he probably wasn't, uh, uh, maybe some of his neighbors weren't too excited about all the squirrels around there, but uh, anyway, you got to admire somebody that loves animals like he did. But, uh, back to, uh, you know, the wildlife art as, is it art or is it, uh, is it not? Uh, my experience when I started going to college, you know, to get an art degree, I was a, a wildlife artist and I went to a liberal arts school and you know, one professor said to me, what are you going to do? Are you going to paint ducks and cattails all day long? You know, there's got to be other things you can paint. And, you know, I, I took that as like a, it wasn't exactly a supportive comment. So, uh, you know, I did start looking and, and you know, becoming more, uh, I took the blinders off and, you know, learned as much as I could about different art history and artists and different genres. and. It's not that I poo-pooed um, wildlife art because art is art, I think, no matter what. Uh, the one thing I did notice, sometimes when there's uh, money and financial things uh, connected with doing art, it, it does throw in a monkey wrench into the, the spirit of the artist. Uh, for me anyway, um, it's like, oh, it's got to be perfect, it's got to, you got to paint every pin feather and you got to get the glint of the eye just right, and it's like, eh, I think in real art, whether it's wildlife art or not, you know, you just got to relax and just let come out what's going to come out, and uh, and it shows in the work, and, uh, and I think the, the work we've selected of Roger shows um, his joy and uh, his spirit coming through the brush strokes. So this is another uh, one of his lovely springtime paintings. It's white tails in the springtime. Uh, incidentally, uh, all of these uh, paintings that I'm showing are from the Historical Society's collection. And this particular scene, um, shows a, a pair of fawns, a pair of twins, and their mother grazing on a hillside. 
and uh, it looks kind of like a northern northern Minnesota scene. But uh, how many people have been out for walks and seen a, a little Bambi nestled in the weeds? Mm -hmm. I haven't. I wish I would come upon it, but I guess they just kind of sit there and lay there, just like this one. So uh, Roger was a careful observer of uh, nature and wildlife, and, and I, I think he pretty much nailed it on this painting here. So, let's see if I have any other comments. No other comments on this one. So anyway, uh, we have the cougar painting, and I, I think when he titled it, he had exclamation point after the word cougar. Uh, back when you painted this in the 60s, uh, this may sound kind of funny, but you know, if, if he would have painted that painting in today, in today's society, people might get a little chuckle because cougar has a different meaning now. You know, um, it was kind of a funnier thought I had, but uh, anyway, the cougar is the, the largest cat predator in the, in the country. And, and in this particular painting, again, um, is really well done and it captures the spirit of the animal and its habitat too, so. So this particular painting here, Pheasants in Autumn Habitat, uh, was painted as a commemorative print in 1981. And um, ringneck pheasants were not native to this country. They were introduced uh, in 1881. And Roger painted this print on the 100th anniversary of uh, the successful uh, introduction of this pheasant into our country. So they're doing pretty good. It's a beautiful painting. And this particular painting is, I believe, his most popular painting. Um, it shows uh, a fall autumn scene with uh, the dark blue stormy skies. This. Uh, flock of snow geese is coming in and there's a lot of drama associated with this particular painting and people it just resonates with people uh, got way in the distance uh, an insinuated farm scene where it's just kind of there showing that it's uh, agricultural land that the birds are flying over but it's, it's just a beautiful painting and this is probably the the most widely distributed and, and printed piece that Roger ever had. So, he's from Beyond the North Wind. Pretty poetic title. So, uh, I just showed, you know, a number of his uh, more famous paintings, and now we're going to talk a little bit about some of Roger's writing that he did, um, you know, for conservation efforts and. Uh, natural resources. Um, the, the book title Outdoor Horizons is uh, a book that Roger contributed his writings to and uh, there's many many illustrations and uh, images of his uh, wildlife in the book too. And it's available, it's really reasonable. I, I think I paid twelve dollars for a hardcover book off Amazon so if anybody's interested, uh, it's a great book and it doesn't cost much. It's uh, printed in 1957, but it's a quality book and it's for anybody that's interested in the outdoors and conservation. So uh, does anybody remember the Minnesota Volunteer Magazine? Uh, I think it's still being printed. Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay, well, uh, Roger, uh, wrote articles for uh, that magazine many, many times, and they're all online to be read. So if you're interested in reading his work, uh, he also contributed a lot of artwork for the covers of those little magazines, too. Uh, so Minnesota Today is another magazine that uh, Roger contributed his written work to. and. Uh, 
you know, he, he, uh, he kind of set a course uh, when he was younger about what he wanted to do and, uh, you know, he had uh, a 40 or 50 year career doing it, writing about conservation and wildlife, and painting it, and uh, he lived a life that he wanted to live. Uh, some of you may remember um, the wildlife calendar that he put out every year. He, uh, this uh, image up there shows the, the ad that was in the Boys Life magazine in 1965, I think it was. But he had the same ads in National Wildlife magazine, and all different kinds of uh, wildlife and um, conservation magazines. So he was sending calendars all over the country. And, you know, as a practicing artist myself, what a great way to distribute, distribute your work. Um, you know, it, it's a communication vehicle having a calendar because everybody wants a calendar. You know, even in the digital age where you can dial up your calendar on your phone, it's still nice to see what day it is on the wall, right? <laughs> so, and uh, Roger uh, became even more famous, you know, because, you know, uh, people were able to buy his artwork and they, they would rip off a page when the month was done and they would frame the picture. And that was a common practice. So a, a pretty smart way to distribute your art. And uh, the uh, Roger was pretty fortunate to uh, have a publisher that published a lot of his artwork and into limited edition prints. And, uh, you know, it was the day and age, the 1960s and 70s, mm -hmm. where uh, maybe printing wasn't real cheap, but you could get, you know, a thousand prints off a painting and, and uh, you know, whether they were duck stamp uh, prints or regular regular edition of wildlife prints, you could uh, sell those to everybody and their brother. And uh, so the only danger in that is saturating the market, then you can't sell the prints. But uh, but he did pretty darn good. So with that, we'll go to the next slide. Okay. Um, another uh, thing that Roger was really good at, he got along with people and he liked serving on boards and um, doing public service work. And say what you want, um, um, you know, sometimes there is uh, um, well, there's different reasons people serve on committees. But Roger really loved the outdoors and um, protecting wildlife habitat. And um, it was in him really strong. So, you know, he. Uh, continue writing his articles for uh, different uh, natural resource outfits, conservation, wildlife magazines, and uh, he shared his artwork whenever he could with Ducks Unlimited, Dozens Forever, and uh, you know, so it helped further the cause of what he believed in, and it also helped him too. So it's, it's kind of like the old uh, religious thing, if you help somebody, you get it threefold in return. And maybe that's why he was so blessed, who knows. But uh, anyway, Roger uh, supported a lot of state and federal conservation and natural resource professionals. Uh, and that was state and federal. Uh, he, uh, I think on the next slide I have a comment about uh, how he was awarded uh, the highest civilian award by the U.S. Department of Interior for his volunteer work. Mm -hmm. So he was really uh, uh, a go-getter, and his enthusiasm was unsurpassed. So, and this photograph here was, uh, I took it out of the Outdoor Horizons book that he helped write, and uh, they were up at the Superior Aquatico National Park black duck hunting. And he was showing youngster how to rig up decoys. 
So anyway, um, Roger won a ton of awards. Way too many to put on a slide or two even. But these are the major ones, uh, starting with that, the Duck Stamp Award, a federal award, 1949. Uh, everyone's heard of the Audubon Society. Uh, he uh, won an art award, the print of the year, 1959. National Wildlife Federation, print of the year, 64. And, uh, and then when our country turned uh, 200 years old, he was named the U.S. Bicentennial Wildlife Artist, 1976. The, uh, the last major award that he received was the, the Civilian Public Service Award for the Wild Waterfowl and wild, Wildlife Conservation. And uh, that was really a, a wonderful thing for Roger. And, uh, you know, he, uh, he received a lot of awards, and I don't know uh, how he handled that without getting a big hit. You know, I guess that remains to be seen how he did that, but uh, it's one thing to do the work, but recognition is always a tough thing. Okay. Roger, uh, really, really believed in um, waterfall protection, uh, wildlife habitat uh, conservation, and he donated 114 acres of public hunting land to uh, the U.S. Department of the Interior, and they created this waterfall production area. And I tell you what, it is a beautiful piece of land. It's uh, on the north side of Lake Tatanka. I was just up there yesterday. And I thought, I love my job. Because I pulled in there, mm -hmm. and uh, I would have uh, walked around more, but I didn't want to pick up any more wood ticks than I've been getting lately. And um, but anyway, uh, it's a beautiful area. It's got a, a huge pond, or a small lake, one or two. And if you go hunting up there, it's public hunting ground, anybody can go there, but you cannot use lead shot. You have to use uh, the, the new style of uh, duck loads. Uh, what is that? Um, steel shot versus lead, okay? So anyway, uh, this was a, a real great collaborative project, joint venture partnership with the Outdoor Heritage Fund, I believe that's a government fund, taxpayer money, uh, joined with Minnesota Pheasants Forever and the Isaac Walton League of Ochana. So if you get a chance, you walk up there and I, I think, uh, I didn't see any trails, but I believe anybody could go up there anytime and enjoy the property. But you know, when you talk about leaving a legacy behind, uh, you know, and, and putting that much money on the line you know, to, uh, you know, in parallel with your beliefs, Roger was, you know, he had the integrity. He really uh, um, believed in this. And um, he left this land behind for people to enjoy and to uh, hunt on. And, and he, he probably saw that hunting lands were getting more scarce for the common person. I remember when I moved to Waterville in, uh, in the late 90s, I went to 10 different places in Waterville, rural Waterville, to uh, hunt, and I received 10 no's. Okay, well I didn't know anybody either, but uh, it's just a, a fact that uh, good hunting land is hard to find. So, and if private parties have it, they're not going to really allow just anybody to hunt on it. So having public hunting ground is really important. So in addition to uh, Rogers WPA that he had set up, um, he donated 23 or 24 of his original paintings to uh, Augustana College in South, I think it's South Dakota. Um, it's a Lutheran college anyway. Um, 
Lesseur County Historical Society has 30 some pieces of his art in the repository and there's a, a really good bunch of batch of his artwork at the Minnesota Historical Society um, in their collection. They, uh, the Minnesota Historical Society has a, a, a great uh, display of Roger Price and Adolf Dane's work, two historical, or excuse me, two of the Seward County artists up there represented, representatives of the county, so it's pretty neat. Um, another thing that Roger left behind was he kind of blazed a trail for other duck stamp artists to uh, start participating in the competition that uh, he was the first member first class of uh, the competitive uh, contest. Um, so he, uh, like I said, blazed a trail for new up-and-coming artists. Um, he also helped legitimize wildlife art as a true art form, a genre. And uh, of course he, he left behind the WPA, the Wildlife Production the wetland production area. So, pretty wonderful guy. Mm -hmm. This is one of his quotes that I really liked. It was, through my work, my basic goal was to help people appreciate and understand nature. My best aspirations have been fulfilled if I was a small voice for our woods, waters, and wildlife. If I have influenced children and adults to become more environment conscious, and if my art brought others a measure of joy. Mm. And, uh, you know, if you knew Roger at all, that really sounds like him. Mm. You know, he, uh, he was full of words. You know, he wasn't shy talking, was he? Uh -huh. So, uh, anyway, you know, I think if, you know, we could extrapolate this uh, quote into uh, the younger generation, get them away from the electronics, <coughs> uh, get them out in nature. It's a very healing place to be. Uh, you know, get people away from their work, get them out in you know into the woods and you know around the water to see the wildlife, and uh, that's what Roger uh, loved, and you know it's what influenced him to become an artist. So. Uh, that's a wonderful quote to live by. So anyway, that kind of wraps up the uh, uh, the main part of the program. Um, the next, uh, the third program of the three is the David Maz um, Wildlife Artist Program. And that'll be uh, first part of fall, October 5th. And you'll see advertisement for it coming out on social media and in the newspapers and whatnot. So um, stay tuned for more information on that. This, uh, this is a program of the Seward County Historical Society. Uh, you know, if you like, you can help preserve history by becoming a member. Uh, it helps fund education programs like this and, and really to help preserve the uh, collection. Uh, if you would see the collection, you to see the, the art that they have. M much of it needs to be reframed, it needs to be put into, uh, you know, a lot of the framing practices from 40 years ago was all acidic. And acid paper eats away at fine art prints. So uh, there's uh, a big push on to get a lot of paintings reframed and rematted you know, to get away from that acidic material to uh, get more uh, conservation quality framing on this art, valuable artwork. Because it is an artifact of the county and it tells county history. So um, anyway, thanks for being a, a patient audience. <laughs>